Welcome to our Africa Tech segment. The growth of technology startups in Africa can be linked to what some experts have described as the fourth industrial revolution period. The argument by some of these experts is that the world is going through a global revolution which places emphasis on, on how people can use their knowledge to innovate. Innovation is key to the development of every startup and in Nigeria this is being driven by software applications to address the needs of individuals and society. Our guest on the program today, techpreneur Shalom Dixon, joins us to discuss more on this. Thank you so much for joining us on Network Africa. Thank you very much for having me. So let's begin with this. What's power in technology innovation in Nigeria today, would you say? Okay, so I think there are a couple of segments to it. First of all, there are the millennials who believe they can do anything, they can change the world. We have that segment, then we have other people like that who believe they can be entrepreneurs. Then we also have um, people who have made money from businesses doing other things in Nigeria. And these two groups of people, they see what's happening in Silicon Valley and they're inspired by that. Mm -hmm. And they believe they can emulate that and make that happen here in Nigeria. So I think yeah. those are the... Well, what would you say is the secret source from Silicon Valley that we here in Nigeria can emulate? Oh, well, I think, um, okay, the f first of all, all technology is driven by some science, so it's backed up by some science. So at the heart of all technology is some science. And I'd like to use this analogy to describe this. So imagine we have a lake, and this lake is covered in ice because it's winter, right? And it's so solid that we can actually build a house on it. That's what I call, like, surface advancement, surface level advancement. So if we have such kind of advancement not built from the foundation, summer will come and it will melt, right? Mm -hmm. So the science is what supports that structure that you have on top. So that science is very important. Mm -hmm. So this science is what um, empowers people. So that's where you have the human resources. So they're able to attract top talents around the world. Then we have also high capital, which is also what drives it. And mm -hmm. some companies in Nigeria, they are working like Decagon Institute. They are working to make that happen, to create that large pool of, of talent we need. Yeah, but for some of these startups, being innovative is not the issue, but getting access to funding, what, what, what do you make of this? Do you think this is what a lot of startups are facing? Yeah, this, this is a tricky question because I can actually shoot myself in the leg here okay. if I say that the, the funding is not the problem because I need the funding, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, So, but, but I think it's, it's tricky and here's why. You can never over-innovate. There's no mm -hmm. such thing as you are innovating too much. So there's always an open question you for innovation. Always need the yes, funding. yes. So, but even you can innovate around seeking funding, around the execution, not just about the idea. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of companies in Nigeria that are innovative enough still. So how do we differentiate between the ones who are really innovative and the ones who are really not that innovative? Well, you look at them and say, okay, with the minimal funding you've been able to gather within the context of Nigeria, what have you actually done? So when you compare all of that and you compare the quality of the founders, then we can know that, okay, for this segment, innovation is a problem. For that segment, finance or funding is a problem. I think I already have an idea or to your answer to my next question, but I'm going to ask anyway. Okay. Do you think we have enough angel investors? Mm. Uh, okay, so angel investors, yeah. the absolute answer is no. We don't have enough because we do not have too much. So we do yeah. not have enough, right? But even for the number of those we have, we do not have enough of the right kind. So there's a difference between startups and SMEs, even though they both seem like they're starting small. The paradox is that a startup has to have that um, willingness to start small, but the potential for growth. So mm -hmm. that's very important. So angel investors have to understand that startups are experiments. So, yeah, and, you sh you should not, yeah. Yeah. so you should not expect some, some kind of like accurate business plan that an SME mm. would give you. You have to look at, you have to fall in love with the innovation and like that. You have to actually look at the potentials and be able to catch that. So there is startup education for angel investors themselves mm. too. So we mm. need a lot of those kinds who can mm. understand that this yeah. is high risk and I'm willing to do this. Too. All right then. Finally, what do you see in the future of technology in Nigeria? Mm. So let's talk about, say, 10 years, okay? Mm -hmm. So right now, what's really encouraging people like me to continue is um, successes from people who have started before us, who have taken the bigger risk. And it took them a lot of time to get where they are. And hopefully, because of what they've sacrificed, it's going to take us a shorter number of time. So we are going to, the successes of our own companies is going to create another wave of successes and of interest too. So, and that's going to have like a, a feedback effect on education because unfortunately, but that's the case, yeah. education is inspired by financial 
gain. So when you see that it's profitable, it's really doing well, it's going to go back and give that feedback in education, mm -hmm. and people are going to train people in STEM and software engineering and all of that, and all then right, we'll have yeah. that pool, and we'll have a very vibrant um, yeah. technological ecosystem. Bright. Yeah, it's very bright, I think right, so. Then. Shalom Dixon, Techpreneur, thank you so much for joining us on Network Africa today. It's been yeah. interesting. Finally, on the program, with a thriving leather industry and cheap labor, Ethiopian shoes have stepped into the international market over the past decade with exotic designs and high quality, and that's starting to seep back into the local market. Companies are adding value to the country's leather industry and producing shoe brands they hope will also help them step beyond the country's borders into regional markets. Sneakers, loafers and low heel pumps are the footwears on the streets of the Ethiopian capital and is more practical than funky or glamorous. Companies like Petards, a British leather company, has a tannery and workshop in Ethiopia. Workshops like NZ Footwear with a group of seven craftsmen and women make high-end shoes from locally sourced materials for a select export market attracting a loyal following. And we care about made in Ethiopia products. Made in Ethiopia products are new to the world, uh, so we want to set the right um, image to the market and to the world. We can be the next Germany, we can be the next Italy, we can be the next anybody who's producing things at a very high standard. And that's what we're, the narrative, the story we're trying to show with our product, that it's all done by Ethiopians, but to the highest international standards. And this, when you believe in people, when you invest in people, uh, and are, you know, take the time to train and develop relationships and, and, and pay people well and incentivize your employees, it's very possible. A pair of brightly colored NZ shoes can cost up to 250 US dollars and production is set to climb to around 1,200 pairs of shoes by the end of 2019. Recent data is scarce on Ethiopian shoe factory worker wages, but a couple but according to industry experts, a worker earned between 60 to 160 US dollars per month in 2016. Shoe salesmen in Addis Ababa say they've seen a change in what they sell and what people buy. Cheap Chinese shoes are becoming a thing of the past, and if people have money, they buy locally made footwear. Previously, society didn't have a good perception of locally made shoes. Now these days, it is getting better and better, primarily because imported shoes are very expensive and we have better supply. Traditionally, most Ethiopian footwear exports were to Europe, but as the world's shoe companies discovered the business potential of the East African nation, exports jumped from around 7 million US dollars in 2007 to 38 million US dollars in 2017. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Teniola Shibwali. Have a lovely weekend.